times, probably played it a thousand times with Bill himself. Awesome. Well, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. And I think I can remember slightly like what his record version was and also a few variations of what, some stuff he did when I played it with him. Excellent. Would you like to get us going here today? Yeah, that would be great. How about if I just show you maybe what I remember a Bill Monroe-esque kind of a version of Salt Creek. Very simple. On the record, I remember he did not do much. It, it was not complex or, of course, uh, no, you know, of course, Bill never did much fingerboard acrobats except during his wild 1950s period when he's doing all that abstract syncopated stuff. Mm -hmm. But this version, on, like on the original record, it just kind of goes like this. Tell me if I'm wrong, Chris, and then I will argue with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hey, David, you might want to turn on your original sound. Oh, yeah. Let me turn on my original sound. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. something like that am i right it's very much something like that and i think that's probably as close as bill would ever play to what he played on the original recording and then uh, there was something that he showed me and did quite often when we played it together he went uh <laughs> went down to that low a and arpeggiated back up simple as that very nice so that is a standard uh device which you have uh, demonstrated ad nauseum correct <laughs> yes yes i've added a lot of nauseum in there I did, yeah <laughs> anyway uh and there's a you know a whole bunch of other stuff that he would do I mean, uh, so sometimes he went on the b part he went I've also seen him come up with it with his middle finger here and go. And just repeat that lick. I've also seen him use a three flat or a three sharp. Uh, I've also seen him come down and use a G natural instead of a G sharp. I've seen him do both. Nice. So there's no fast rule. And as everybody knows, there's really not much of a rule with Monroe. You just know it's Monroe when you hear it. But if you heard him say, if, 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 you, if the recording has a G sharp, and then, then you heard somebody perform it live and say, well, that couldn't be Monroe. He's using a G natural right there. Well, maybe he decided to use a G natural. And this is the kind of stuff I discuss with him. Like, what is it? A three flat or a three sharp? And he say, well, I guess it'd be whatever you want it to be. It'd be whatever I want it to be when I'm playing it. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, one time somebody asked Kenny Baker, what key is that in, Kenny? And he said, well, by God, I believe it's a major minor mix. <laughs> right. Exactly. And it kind of keeps you, keeps it fresh, keeps it interesting, doesn't keep it locked down, doesn't keep it like... I mean, like, he's, he'll nail the tune to the wall every single time, but, you know, it'll be different every single time. And, uh, you know, for those that, that don't know about the, the Monroe Mandolin Appreciation Society on Facebook, it, it's a fun group that, um, that we've been enjoying for a, a number of years. I guess this is our, our eighth year in it, or maybe seventh year. I mean, there was like 4,500 members in it, and it's awesome. It's, all, it's so many of the, the Monroe freaks, and we do like, uh, we, we started back our, our tune of the week 
and uh, and this week we're looking at Panhandle Country. Uh, but anyway, I said all that to say this. And uh, I apologize for not being uh, as a, a, a real contributor. I'm I'm a daily lurker on that, but I haven't I haven't been uh, contributing like during the tunes of the week and stuff. But it's really cool, and I get in there and I watch everybody and what they're doing, and it's, it's really an awesome. Uh, Oh, it's nice. a Facebook page. The, a day doesn't go by where I don't go in and to, to snoop around. I think no need to apologize. I think you're a, a fantastic um, contributor and, uh, and and encourager and all that. Um, fellow just just posted. We we're doing Pan, Panhandle Country, and Josh posted a good, really good version that that he picked out all by ear, which we're real real proud of him for. Um, and it's like so just just to touch on uh, one part of, of of the culture and and how it's changing. And this is my personal perception of it um uh so monroe he was like really hardcore he was a hardcore guy he was a blues guy um and, and like everyone knows the stories about you know hearing about him being a hardcore person in reality um my experience with him was super sweet and like you know and you, you'll hear that a lot um but you know there there is an aspect to his life and his bluesness and you can hear it just his soul screaming in, in the music um, and, and that can, uh, that can do, that can attract a lot of interesting personalities. And I say interesting, what I really mean is, uh, um, samsaric would be another way to, uh, to put it for those that, that, uh, might appreciate that kind of word. Reincarnational is another way to, uh, to, to look at it. Um, what, what I really mean is egotistical, um, and, and, and a lot of competition within, within the Monroe world, a lot of insecurity within, within the Monroe world. David is a, is a really good exam, example of the opposite of that. But I would say he is, uh, maybe a, an exception to the rule when, in my experience, and that's my karma and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, all I have to say is that, um, you know, it can be it can be very competitive because people like you know get like kind of proprietary over their Monroe. They're like, oh, it's my Monroe. Only I know it. Oh, I'm not going to share my taste with you. I'm not going to that all this kind of stuff. And 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 it's really you know laughably ridiculous from a spiritual point of view, and also probably quite um, quite untoward and 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 damaging, like create bad karma, all that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, I used to tease Bill about. I used to tell always tell Bill, man, I know the Monroe style better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and and he you do. And you might be able to explain it and, and teach it better than than he would be able to. I've seen videos of, of people be like, Bill, could you slow that down? Sure. Plays at the exact same speed. Bill, could you play, slow that down a little bit? Sure. Plays at the exact same speed. You know, oh, that's the kind of thing I used to do to him all the time. I used to make him repeat licks at slow speeds, just little tiny little passage fragments. Uh-huh. Yeah, but he would comply. Uh huh. Yeah, different different moments for different uh different relationships for sure. Um, but one of the th one of the cool things about the the Monroe Mandolin Appreciation Society is that there's a lot of goodwill there, and uh, and it's and it's uh it's really kind of fostered, um, uh, a, a, a renaissance. You know, if that's not too big of a word for for the um for the study and and for the music, people sharing it, people encouraging each other. People being like really nice to each other, and uh, just with the with the with the fellowship in mind, or you know, personship, if that's too gendery uh, of a word. Um, anyway, so um, I said a lot to say this. Uh, somebody just posted a, a a video there, and 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 he played the 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 first part, you know, like Monroe's melody, and then he did his own style, and then like he played, you know, all this stuff that didn't sound like Monroe. I mean, it had like a Monroe influence in there, but he was playing it like himself. And and to me, that is the that's the last lesson of Bill Monroe. Don't play it like Bill Monroe, like you know, like play. Bill always said that he 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 was flattered by people that that kind of copy his style or play Monroe style, but he really loved and was totally open-minded about individual people. He wanted to be individual and not play like anybody else. He wanted his band to not sound like anybody else. And like for example, when we watched that uh, uh, together, we watched an entire show of of. Uh, Tony Trishka in Skyline, he was talking about how amazing Barry Mitterhoff is. And then uh, he was talking about all these people like David Grisman and Barry Mitterhoff. He was a big Barry Mitterhoff fan. And uh, people like Dave Apollon. And uh, uh, so he was a very open-minded person and liked all this other kinds of music. And he liked to see what people could do with an instrument. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and that open-minded kind of ness 
although he wasn't so open-minded his brains were falling out of course but the open-minded aspect of of his spirit and his and his heart and all that kind of stuff is the reason that bluegrass is so good because he was not a closed-minded racist like so many of the people of his, of his generation not to use super strong language but um a lot of folks of, of that day were were not going to embrace um the, the folks of color and their music and to bring that into their tradition and all that kind of stuff but you know he had that um his buddy that worked uh you know with uncle pin arnold schultz you know and and he was playing you know according to munner the prettiest runs around and had you know this, this amazing flow that he was bringing up from uh new orleans and synthesizing with the with the local country kind of stuff and so like lots of open-mindedness you know with regard to where the music was coming from and so you know one, one of the parallels i think about today it's like okay so if there was a bill monroe of today what would that look like and the first thing that, that in my mind the, the music is going to either have a rapper a dj or like an r&b singer you know you know because that's the coolest you know black music of the day of right now and so that was the same thing that Munner was doing. Like he was playing the blues. And and so like what, you know, and, and the blues is like, oh, you don't, don't, daughter, don't go down to that blues club. You know, that's where the devil lives, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, but, but that's where, you know, a lot of the spirit, you know, is going to live the most creativity. And so you're thinking about like, you know, who is, who's kind of, you know, and then, the, then there was Elvis and you look at a cat like Eminem, you know, who's like, a lot of people think he's like the greatest white rapper and, you know in a way that there's a lot of parallel there. Of course, you know, you know, if, if, if you couldn't really say like Eminem is like the Bill Monroe of his day because he's not bringing like the the best tradition of like the white culture with it. He's it's just pretty much all, you know, in, into the, the, the urban culture. But he, if he was like, you know, if he had like the best of like, you know, George Jones along with, with, with like, you know, or whatever, Bill, or Bill Monroe, if he brought Bill Monroe into the, into the the hip hop world and he was able to get you know the best of like you know all the best black rap plus the best of all, of all the bill monroe stuff then that would be the bill monroe of like the modern world in my opinion you know or and he'd, and he'd be break dancing and all that kind of stuff like you know i have a dj oh, another thing he was trying to fuse in certain commercial things as long as they were a sound that he liked for example i asked him once why why i had an accordion in, in the bluegrass boys and he said, because at the time, the accordion was the rage. And he said, Lawrence Welk was drawing 5,000 people into concert halls in Chicago every week. And he said that everybody was just like arbitrarily adding an accordion to their group. And because if, if people knew there was an accordion in the band, they didn't care who it was or what kind of music it was. They were going out to see the accordion show. Is it that interesting? And so, you know, we have to really we have to really like you know understand that that bill would say a lot of different things he would say this thing over here and then he would do this other thing over here and so he's like i would never copy another man but i'm going to copy everyone that has a, an accordion in their band you know what i mean you know, the I thing never... is, is he wanted the, he wanted the instrument but he didn't want to sound like lawrence well he just thought if, i wonder if i can get an accordion player to play some blues and then sure enough Sally Ann Foster went down, 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 So he tried to get her to play the blues on the accordion, on the accordion. Diane, did you have a raised hand there? Yeah, I wanted to just say that whole song, Trombolin, right? You, in the beginning of your note for note lesson, you run that little thing of him talking, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a mandolin and a trombone? And it's like, what? Is he just messing yeah. with this or what? Yeah. You know, for those that are not familiar with that story, Monroe has a song called Trombolin, and, and he talked very uh, directly about having this whole other kind of music in his head. And that was just one of the different kinds of music that he had in his head. Um, that was like a, a mandolin and, and a trombone and like maybe uh, like maybe uh, maybe electric guitar or, or drums. He did say drums. Um, and then, but he wasn't going to do that with bluegrass music because he had his fan base and he was not going to betray them and put a drum in there or whatever after a while, although you did, did have the brushes in, in, in some of the recordings like that. Um, yeah, Josh, let me get you unmuted here. Yeah, I, I know I talk about these recordings a lot, but if you haven't checked out the Castle Studios sessions, I think mm -hmm. it's 5051. And there's all sorts of different instruments on there that were not, you know, not considered bluegrass if you went to like a hardcore jam these days you know electric guitars and um 
I, I don't know. You guys, I'm sure you guys may, may know about the history or more information about those sessions. But if you haven't heard those, the playing, and it's just really, really amazing. Almost, and some of it's more synthesized than what we kind of um, think about. As far very as true. You know, people are very quick to put Monroe into a box, but you listen to a, a, a collection like the Castle stuff. Um, and, you know, you can listen to the, the Rawhide outtakes and, and, you know, like, you know, just like learn a lot from, from all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, accordion, organ, electric guitar, uh, some drums in there, mostly mostly brush. But we can't put, put Monroe into a box, you know, like that too easily. You know, and, and everybody likes to – I hear this all the time. Oh, the, the, the producers, the DECA people must have made him put that stuff in. So I, I actually asked Monroe directly, and I said, everybody says that you would never have put electric guitar – an organ and the and the brush uh, the brushed percussion uh, on your records and they made you do it and he said that's not true he said he did it because he wanted to do it. he said no producer could ever make me do whatever they wanted and then he made some reference to if they'd wanted to do that that then I would have uh, then it would have been like sounded like a, a Bradley production and just you know had the the, the four four like uh, Ray Price kind of sound but he refused to ever go get into the commercialization thing and let some other producer come in and take control of what uh, of his creativity he said he wanted the electric guitar in there he wanted the organ because he said he loved he loved organ he said he loved electric guitar really good points there and uh and you know peter uh you know learned so much from from bill and, and you know bill kind of advised him he's a the, the, don't get too far out there there's enough flowers pete runs and all this kind of stuff um and, I, and you know he's doing do his yodeling and and you know peter like like you know he had, you know, uh, he was very brave uh, to do what he did and believe in in the um, in what he was doing and finding the truth in, in in the in the you know Native American you know kind of stuff, the yodeling, the extended stuff. Like he was very brave to do that and receive a lot of criticism for it from some of his heroes. You know, some people were very critical about that, but you know, he just, he just stood there and, and did it. And now he's, you know, we we understand that was a very good thing for him to do. Um, but one thing that uh, that Bill said to him one time after, like you know, Peter had been. You know, synthesizing his own music, you know, he said that Munro said to him one time, "You're playing some of my new music." You know, so so that's Bill saying that Peter Peter's new music was really Bill's new music. <laughs> if you can dig that, then he's like, "That's some of my new music right there." Uh, you know, which is like, you know, it's it's a complicated statement, but there's uh, it's it's interesting because you know the, the shamanic energy which gets transferred, you know, which Peter is well well aware of, you know, from you know master to apprentice, you know, the energy's got to go, it's got to get taught, and you know, like you know, there's some, like the disciples all got you know like healthy chunks of what their like kind of favorite resonance of the energy was, and like you know on the singing side of town, like you know Dell got a huge chunk of of the of of the the energy, Peter got a huge chunk of it, you know, those guys are like you know Bill's big disciples with the singing. And then there's, you know, there, there's the, oh, here, here we go. Dr. Brown's coming in here. All right. So uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Richard Brown from coming to us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Is that yeah, right? Is that for this, this uh, afternoon? Hi there. Hi there, everybody. Welcome. How are you today? Well, not bad. You know, weather's nice here today. Excellent. Glad it's a nice yeah. day. Let me move. Let me move you over here and see if I can get my full screen here. Well, we're really happy to have you here with us, and thanks so much for sending that uh, that video around. And for those yeah. that aren't on the um, Monroe Mental and Appreciation Society, uh, Richard, I should have thought I should have thought to put this in the folder, but he also sent me a uh, a, a wonderful recording. It is really kind of mind blowing in a way because of what happens after it, like the playing's great. And so, uh, you know, and Richard will, 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 will share a, a lot of different things with us. And we'll probably talk about, about this, uh, this uh, night uh, up, in, uh, up in Massachusetts where, uh, where they played, um, where Richard joined the Bluegrass Boys uh, to play Old Joe Clark on stage. And there's a recording of yeah. it. And, uh, and, and Richard and Bill are playing great. And, and literally at the end of it, um, Bill Monroe like screams ain't that great like like the like he's like screaming like at the top of his lungs like i've never heard him him like you know <laughs> that you know, was that was pretty amazing actually yeah. <laughs> pretty amazing and and he had to that just was back in 1988 yeah. <laughs> yeah and he had to just know how special of a, of a person you were and, and a spirit for to be able to play um on that level with him and uh and not, not to mention yeah. all the you know all the the, the you know the complicated ch challenges of of you know 
uh, uh, being a person of color in in uh, in in a, in, a, in a bluegrass world that's filled with with uh, you know people that are not that evolved in in some ways. I'm not trying to go down that yeah. rabbit hole, but it's but by the, that time I've known Bill since I was 19 years old. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like you know, uh, you know, we had we had a little history. So. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and you had sought him out, and and he had you know. Would you talk a little bit about you know like how you got to know Bill? Well, let's see. I'm from New York. Whatever you want to. We're just glad you're here. I'm I'm from New York originally, and uh, I was, I walked over, there's this place where we used to buy instruments, um, and it was an outgrowth of the Folklore Center. It was called the Fretted Instrument. So I think it was like a Monday or Tuesday night, and I'd go down. So I, you know, I took the train down to the city just to go over there and see what's going on, you know, and I said, hey, let me... uh, let me go see what's going on there. And, um, and uh, you know, I ran into Fred Weiss and a couple of other people. And I said, what's happening? And they said, oh, you know, we're getting together. This was Grisman's band, the New York Ramblers. And they were saying, oh, we're going to get together and practice. And I said, oh, wow, can I, uh, do you mind if I just listen? And, and I said, nah, you know, Dave, uh, you know, David doesn't want, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I just want to see how you guys do harmony and stuff like that because I was kind of interested in learning how to do harmony singing. And this is like 1964, so and uh, we're you know so I'm so Artie Rose popped in. He said, "Why don't you go over to Ralph's house?" You know, and Ralph Renzel lived around the corner because Bill Bill Monroe's in town and he's going to be there. And I said, "I don't know Ralph very much, so um, in fact, I don't know him at all. I've just seen him at shows, you know." Uh, so. Um, I went over with Artie Rose and we walk in and we meet Bill Monroe and uh, and we're sitting there and Bill Keith's there and I knew Bill Keith because he w- he'd been to New York a few times and we jammed together in the square in Washington Square and I was a guitar player and uh, so I introduced to Bill and Bill uh, and Bill Keith or Brad as he's known then turns around and says hey um, you know uh, Richie plays bluegrass guitar. <laughs> and so Bill walks over to Doc Watson, who's there, and takes away um, the D18 he was playing, gives it to me. He says, you know, uh, you know that, uh, you know that little uh, tune I do, uh, sitting on top of the world, you know, can you do that up and be natural, you know, help me out on the course, you know. And so, and uh, let's see, who's there? Jack Cook was there, and uh, Jack Cook and Bill Keith were there. And, uh, you know, and uh, so we we all we all played and, and sang and did a few more tunes with him, and that was pretty it was pretty wild. You know? <laughs> That's so a big home on the train, you know, and I was saying, wow, you know, I played with the father of bluegrass. That is really <laughs> it's really. Well, you were ready for that moment, and and he knew you were ready for that moment. I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, mean, I could have been more. I could have been more ready for that moment. You know, it's kind of. I feel you there. It's like it's a, kind of. It's kind of wild. Trial by fire. Yeah, you know, I just yeah. That's, and you, I think that's the way Bill liked it. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's the the spontaneity of the of the quantum moment there. But but you've been also been knowing David since the '60s too. Is that right? Yeah. I, well, let's see. You know, I think I met David. Really, I knew of David, but I knew David. David came to my house in 1981 when he was playing with the J and B, and um, and he had his lore. And I think I had just done this. Yeah, I think I had just done my long run of the day or something like that. I ran. Well, I years. had met you. I met you in the ni- late 1960s. I guess it was New York City, and. Uh, it was some jam session, but I was a kid and you didn't really, you didn't, I was a big fan of yours and knew all about you and, and kind of follow what wow. you were doing during the seventies. Wow. That's, that's And wild. then, uh, I saw you a few times in the seventies, but I guess you probably just didn't take notice of me until I was a celebrity mandolin player. <laughs> but I, you, you were a big influence on me as a kid. So. Well, I, I heard about you from, you know, um, because after you joined the JMB, you know, and you came, you came to our house. Cause right, we, I remember we that. party before the concert and we, we jammed together all afternoon. That's right. We swapped <laughs> mandolins. Yeah. Also, but in the, in the early seventies, 
you had your uh, your fern mandolin and you passed it to me when I was a kid. Yeah, wow. Hey, that's that's amazing. That's good. Yeah, there, there it is, right there. There she is. What this? What, what this? Year? What year is that? Harry West. So oh, beautiful. What year yeah. is that? My well, years, it's um, 27. 27, wow. Yeah, I bought it in 19, 1968 from Harry West for and 1100 bucks. And... Which was a lot of money at that time. Yeah, it was. Everybody said, you're crazy, man. You're crazy <laughs> paying that much for a mandolin. But then Monroe had recommended you get one like his. Or, or is... Yeah, right. He said, uh -huh. he said that would help you. You know, I tried, um, I used to play Bill's ma mandolin when he came to the... Uh, came to the 47, you know, and I was just trying to learn, you know, and, uh, you know, I got some stuff because Joe Val was, Joe Val was there and, uh, you know, and I knew Joe pretty well and, uh, and I used to go there all the time and every now and then I'd fill in with the Charles River Valley boys on, on bass, you know, and, uh, you know, and I'd come there and uh, so, you know, Bill, Bill had me play something. I was playing something on his mandolin and he said, you know, you need to get yourself a man like this, you know, you do a whole lot for your playing, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, what, what year did you get that mandolin? 1968. 68. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's about, that's about. Grisman got his first lore in like 64 or 65, and he got that from Harry West. Yeah, $500. Yeah. yeah, I know. I played, I played that mandolin too. Um, I, I, I got a little yeah. Yeah, no, I, I remember he did he did pay five hundred bucks for that. And that then, he, then he, he got rid price. of the lore because he and they got he has he got his twenty seven. So you had matching mandolins for years, and so really during my uh, 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 those influential years of the nineteen seventies, you were playing your your twenty seven fern, and Grisman was playing his twenty seven fern. And for years, yeah. I thought that was kind of like the cool mandolin to have, but I couldn't find <laughs> one. And I, and I was borrowing uh, Mike Seeger's 23 Lore. That's a nice mandolin. That's and that's the mandolin cool. I ended up with. So wow. I've got, this, is the yeah. one, this is the one that you swapped that yours. Yeah, I, yeah, I played that. That's a great mandolin. Mine, and I played yours yeah. at, the, at that 1981 party. And then we saw each other occasionally since then. So, yeah. Yeah, because you came to our house. Um, yeah. We had a... a a Johnson Mountain Boy revival party, or yeah, and we like came up, we came to our house when we moved around the corner where we are now. I'm up on the third floor. <laughs> well, I'm still and, a big fan of yours. I've always loved what you do, and still do. It's it's really amazing. Well, I I like I like your playing because you you kind of made Monroe style playing cool. You know, oh, thanks. everybody. Uh, you know, you and. Um, you and Chris and and uh, Mike Compton, you know, you guys got got the style out there. I mean, I think that's why Bill was really excited at that at that show because, you know, it was on Cape Cod and we we have a we have a summer house there and like we, you know, we um, a guy I know just you know said that Bill Monroe was coming and I said oh I said we'd be glad to open for him I said we've opened for him before, and uh, then so they came. And ironically, they were going to go to, uh, they were going to go up to, uh, um, they were, they were going to go to um, Owensboro, Owensboro, Kentucky. And I'd never heard of Owensboro because we invited them over for breakfast the next morning. We, and they said, oh, no, no, we got to go to, we got to go to Owensboro, Kentucky. Uh, jet's coming in for us in the little airport tomorrow morning and we got to be there. I was, I was thinking, where the hell is Owensboro, Kentucky? You know? uh -huh. And then later on, I'd end up, you know, I didn't know I'd end up being in Owensboro, you know, a lot more than I ever thought I would be. But um, yeah, it, it um, but that night, you know, I came after I got, uh, we got off a of stage and like Bill, Bill came running up to me, he said, play me one. And we, we played Dusty Miller together and he was like really excited. And I'd ask Tom Ewing, I said, what, why, why is Bill so excited? He said, well, he said, I think you inspired him. And I said, me? I said, what are you kidding me? I said, you know, he can play me under, you know, he could play, uh, you know, play me under the table, you know? And he said, no, no. And, and I think it was really just seeing that some people, because a lot of people weren't paying that, play, still weren't playing that style, you know, people wanted to, you know, people wanted to just do a lot of stuff up and down the neck. And so it was really, I think it was really cool that, uh, you know, 
that was uh, that was a good that was a good thing. Richard, would you mind if I just took a, took a second and played the end of that old Joe Clark with you and Bill Monroe and where he where he's yelling about how awesome it is? Can I play that real quick, everybody? Yeah. Okay, here we go. I just want to play the end of this so you can hear how excited Monroe was. Yeah. Can y'all hear? Can y'all yeah. hear that? Yeah. Go ahead. That. Ain't that good? <laughs> we got to stick together, Richard. That's that's Bill Monroe screaming. How you like that? Ain't that good? We've got to stick together, Richard. I have yeah. never heard him raise his voice like that on stage. He was totally excited. Yeah. Amazing. That and that was his his mandolin. Uh, he just had it back for maybe. Um, maybe hit it back for a year. It was sounding, it was sounded pretty good. <laughs> oh gosh, y'all sound great together. That's some, some of the best. You, you were playing his mandolin? No, no, I was playing this one. Oh, okay. He, he was playing his mandolin, but I played it after the show. It was, uh, you know, that was after it had been busted up and everything like that. Cause I have the first time that we opened for Bill was here in Cambridge. And it was like a few days after his mandolin got busted up because there's some pictures of that floating around and he's playing, um, he's playing Darrington's uh, floor, you know, with the pick guard on it and everything. And everybody was wondering why, why Monroe has a mandolin with a pick guard on it. And that was, that was, um, you know, that was the reason because it was Charlie Darrington's. But uh, that, that was a pretty interesting thing. You know, another night, another, another cosmic thing that happened my my good friend, well, my good late friend, who um, who has um, who uh, he he came to the party late, and he just purchased uh, uh, he just had purchased a, a twenty three lore for I think he paid eight thousand dollars for it, and uh, you know it was the same the same day you guys came, and his wife was about to kill him because. <laughs> um, Rod was a banjo player, and he played banjo in our band that we we put together. And he was uh, that Richard leaves with his wife Margaret. The re the reunion band. You can find some recordings in uh, the website yeah. online. Yeah, and uh, at that time we were stony lonesome, but okay, actually so that actually Tater Tate's playing Margaret's bass in that show. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, that's that's really um yeah that was um that, that all the all these things happened. Brian Aldridge has that mandolin that Rod had. Rod passed away. He was a really good friend of mine. He had a um, he had a brain tumor and passed away in 05. Um, that was really, really sad. But um, yeah, he uh, really was a good guy. But it was just this cosmic thing. <laughs> he came, he bought that, he bought that uh, mandolin. And uh, that, that was a good, that's a good one too. Um, but like I said, Brian Aldridge has it now. Yeah, he, he kind of went through a couple of owners and uh, Rod kind of decided to sell it at a certain point. He said, well, I don't play the mandolin. So he, he sold it and put the rest of the money in and bought a Gilchrist. <laughs> so. so you had you had been playing Salt Creek, uh, kind of a, more of a maybe the, the traditional kind of fiddle, 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 fiddly way. But then you got with Munro. And and you're like and he and he said something like you got you know take take some notes out or something like that. You know, I know you didn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was trying to get you know. that that tone and that sound. You know, basically Monroe has the syncopation to his playing, and I'd kind of played it like in the beginning. You know, like I guess if you look online, you can find a lot of people playing it sort of like I did, and it wasn't. You know, it was just kind of. It was kind of somewhat notey and a little bit, um, you know, it had some, but it didn't have that feel, you know, it didn't have that fiddle feel, didn't have the syncopation. And, uh, you know, there were a few tunes I knew and I knew how to sort of start playing that way, you know, when I played slow with tr tremolo, but then when you played open, you know, you, you know, like going back to old Kentucky and old Joe Clark, those were a little bit easier to get that and getting the tunes like Dusty Miller down and stuff like that. And, Mm -hmm. trying to get patty on the turnpike down you know those those things maybe a little bit easier but then i kind of i kind of talked to monroe that day because i i met him down at uh this was like 19 
this would be 1969, right before I went to dental school. So I kind of, um, he was at Philadelphia Folk Festival. So, so I happened to be- Were you about 18, 20 years old? How, how, how old were you then? How old was I then? I was probably about- A little older? I was about 24 then. About 24, okay. That's yeah. Good. And and Bill in 1969, he would have been what 58 or something like that. Yeah, that's it's not that old. I can remember when I was 58. <laughs> I just think that's awesome that you know a, a young man you know could you know have the, the 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 smart idea and the courage to be like I'm gonna ask Bill Monroe to hang out and teach me stuff. It's great. Yeah, so we were sitting there and he just said, "Hey, you know, um, hey, I he said, um, you know, and I said, you know, I showed him my mandolin and he played it, and then. I said, you know, I want to know how you get that tone. And he said, well, he said, play Salt Creek. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play Salt Creek. And uh, I played it and it was, it's kind of, you know, let me uh, see, I know my mandolin's attacking. You need a new mandolin instead of that piece yeah. of junk. I know these old mandolins, you know, I should get a nice new one. A good pickup has put it in. I don't know what this thing is doing now. My tuner is uh, maybe it's the maybe it's the battery. So I've spent half, half, half my life playing, uh, half my life tuning, half my life playing out of tune. <laughs> no. No, oh, that's too far. While Richard's tune, I'm going to mute him, and I'm just going to brag on him for a second. So I, I met uh, Richard at, at IBMA, and uh, in the in, in the hallways of the uh, of, of the den of the of the, the Monroe freaks that would that would gather, you know, every every year here and there. And uh, and the thing that that impressed uh, me most about Richard's style is that uh, there's a particular kind of tone that uh, that um, that comes to me to in my mind from the late 70s and and the and the early 80s and and I feel like the the, the two best proponents of that sound are Richard and uh and Mike Compton although the it's different flavors d different flavors um to me Compton's is, is like more like more kind of shuffly and then to me Richard's playing is is for lack of a better word a little clunky in the best way there's this kind of floppy clunky awesome charming and maybe richard would have a better uh descriptor for it like uh, i'm gonna hey richard i gotta ask to un unmute you again i i i muted you just just for a second there but i gotta you gotta hit a little button i'm gonna say ask to unmute and, and you, you can hit a button there because i'm yeah you know. um but but there's there's an, I, I i need to find a better word for for what i'm trying to describe do you have a word for that I don't know. <laughs> I just kind of say, I've been trying to get more tone, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, trying to go for that tone, you know, it's like, this is like a journey, you know, it's like, you don't ever have it, you know, you just kind of keep hearing things and you hear new wrinkles to something you thought you had and you say, wow, that's the note that I didn't hit. And it's kind of like, you feel like, wow, I got to I got to go home and, and play that, you know, and you just kind of keep playing it over and over and you go, I, I got it, you know, and then, you know, and then you go on to the next thing. To me, it's like, this is like archaeology, you know, you discover something and you kind of put it together and, you know, so it's, it's like a lifelong journey, you know. To me, there's, there's, go, go ahead, David. You want Richard, to would you do me a favor, uh, all of us a favor, please, and maybe aim your camera down a little lower, because when you play, I'd like to see your right hand if possible. Yeah, can you? Thank you. That's perfect. Oh, okay. Good. Good. Let's see. What did I used to do for Salt Creek? I used to do something like <laughs> it was kind of more like a guitar solo you know on the, on the mandolin yeah almost everybody plays that lick like 
something like that over no, that's beat. not you gotta go like you gotta you gotta hammer that you just gotta hammer that note and hang on it because that was one of the it deep sounds notes. so cool when you play yeah. it against the yeah. other th the other notes you know i mean that's that's the cool thing you know you kind of go like and i bet that this is probably one of these early early versions of that break that Monroe did because it sounds like he's playing the the rhythm of the tune and then he's also doing he's also doing this whole uh you know just playing the outline of the tune because I think I'm tr I'm trying to think um you know I'm trying to think who played rhythm guitar on that first when that first cut and let's see Oh God, it's a guy, a guy who also plays fiddle with him. He's all, he's played fiddle with him, but um, I'll think of his name. Um, let's see. Yeah, um, but anyway, he, you know, and he's kind of like, he's kind of like all over, he's playing a lot of runs on it and it doesn't have, but Bill's like doing a, a rhythm on that. And he's, 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 um, you know, he's got it. He's just got Bentley it. Williams. Again. Guitar. Benny Williams. Benny Williams. Yep, that's it. Horace Benny Williams. Yes, Got it. that's right. Okay, that's all Bill did in the beginning. And but he had, you know, he said you got to hit all these strings. So you know, these open strings like this. Can you see that? I I can. Um... Yeah, we we can we can see. see okay, it. Put your hands there. Oh, can I can I chime in there just for a second? I just want to point out a couple couple things. Uh, you know, so so so, Dr. Brown's hopping hopping off the A string like, like Bill. You know, most of y'all probably yeah. been well well aware of that. Another one of the sounds that, that the great sounds that that, he, that he's getting, you know, he either coming from the second fret of the A down to the fifth fret of the D, or up from the second fret of the D up to the fifth fret. Or, but if yeah. you'll, you'll notice, there, there's this sound here. You get a slight double stop, yeah. and it, it turns out to be a 51 double stop in, in C. And you also get that at the end. So if you're, yeah. if you're looking for those tones, that's where they are. It's a, it's a 51 in, one, one in, in G, fifth fret of the A, third fret of, of the G. Good stuff. But if you listen to that recording, he didn't do that then. Right. He kind of did. He, Good point. He just did the notes, you know. Exactly. He just did that. But then when he taught it to me, he done, you know, he did that. modulating between the flat seven and the natural seven fifth fret of yeah. the D, sixth fret of the d david was mentioned in that earlier great uh variety yeah it's it just sounds it sounds cool it sound it sounds inspiring and you kind of like keep turning the record back and you kind of say let me listen to that again let <laughs> me listen That's you know right. they're just little pieces of that that you listen to i don't know if you've ever listened to the recording he ever did with um flattened scruggs when they were with the band rose of old kentucky sure that's got a really serious groove in it you know because flat is right on the you know like chubby wise just does this turnaround and he goes do 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 and you know and then flat hits the guitar do 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 and you know doom and then and then monroe comes in she bloomed for me you know that that was just that's cool. That that's that's in, that's in the key of B, you know. And that was just that's that's really that's really a good one. You so know? Richard is pointing out an iconic recording that is you know required reading or required listening for for any yeah. you know, really trying to get the, the big picture. Rose of old Kentucky. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that's that's a good one. Probably yeah, beat, I believe. 40, 40, 46. And it's got some neat it's got some neat bill stuff on there, you know. That last lick that that that, that Dr. Brown was playing. <laughs> That's how you get these really cool tones. Great. Talk about, talk about desirable dirt and the earth tones. Like you hear it like very distinctly in yeah. Dr. Brown's playing. Yeah, I love, uh, you, you have beautiful texture and, and brush strokes of, of a great painter. It's oh really beautiful what you do. <laughs> It's right magical. Yeah. But I don't know, you know, you just try to, you just kind of keep trying to change this stuff. You know, you kind of get, you know, you do it and you kind of like, you just follow, you know, you follow other aficionados such as you guys and you kind of want to, you know, I, I wish that, you know, there were, I mean, Grisman was actually playing some Monroe, but then Grisman got into his really, his own thing, you know, and every now and then, you know, I'd see him. When I met Monroe, I mean, when I met Grisman in, in, in 66, he was a, like, he was a Monroe freak. Yeah, he really was. All through the, all through the 60s. And then, then he got into the gypsy kind of stuff. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it kind of, uh, and that became, that became his identity, you know. Right, his own, music, his own music became his identity. Good for him, man. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. I didn't know how deep the dog was in, in the real letter and spirit of Monroe style until I until I heard the, the stuff in the in the mid and and late '60s because you know when, once you hear him after that, he's the dog. But 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 before that, he is a Monroe disciple, like a oh yeah. In '67, they were playing it because um, I you know lived, they were playing at the club '47. Monroe used to come in like and he would stay for a week in Cambridge. And he'd stay at Jim Jim Rooney and, and Bill Keith's house, and um, you know he'd come in in the bus, and the guys would sleep in the bus, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I remember when Peter was playing with him, they'd leave the bus out at, at Peter's, you know, parents' house out in Wayland, which mm -hmm. is a suburb, you know, it's probably about 15 miles west, and uh, you know they they would come in and and Bill would. But I guess Bill would still stay at Keith and Rooney's house because it was right in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. But um, when they'd stay in, you know, the, I remember a few times they stayed there. They parked the, well, I didn't live that far from there. But, you know, they parked the bus up there and, you know, Roland, I, I remember Roland and when Byron was playing with him, they slept on the bus, you know, and um, let's see, I was trying to think of who he was. Um, I'm trying to think of Bill's girlfriend at the time. Is it Bessie? Uh, or Virginia? It was Virginia, Virginia Stouffer, yeah, right. And she was, uh, she she and Bill would stay in the house and, uh, you know, the band the band would stay in there and uh, let's see, and yeah, James was playing bass then, so he, you know, he was there. I don't think, but but Byron and, and Roland stayed in the bus, you know. I believe that Virginia might've played a little bass also, is that right? You know, I know the I don't know, I never, I never saw her play, uh, I never saw her play either. And I, you know, I never, I never really talked to her and I, I was really sorry, I never, I never met Bessie either, you know, so I, I have no, you know, I have no recollection. Powerful woman there. Well, yeah. what, what about your, what about your, your B part to Old Salt Creek? Any, any, uh, Anything oh, I'm kind of well, that, that's kind of cool too. I mean, I liked, I liked that, you know, because he kind of, he kind of does, he kind of does those things, you know, like you, you know, well, people call him, show me how to do those slidey things, you know, the slidey things. We like slidey yeah. things. Yeah. I slide into an A that way, but sometimes I like to let my finger up off of the uh, off of the second string because I use that. I use try to use that that A chord just to locate where I should be on the on that on the uh, first string, you know. Thank you. 
So yeah. he, what Bill said, you know, what he said to me then that was really funny. And I didn't think, you know, and he said, well, he said, you know, you got to get that little finger out there like a shortstop going after a ground ball, you know. I love that analogy. <laughs> that is the country is corn. And uh, that was that was that was pretty cool. And I, you know, but I just said that. I remember Phil Zimmerman always remembers that. He always would remind me. And he said, "Oh, tell him about when Monroe told you like that was like a shortstop going after a ground ball." You know, that was. Uh, that's, but you know that was that was that was Bill. You know, <laughs> that was, so so the big distinction to, to me for the for the students and anybody you know watching this is it's not going like a, this. Yeah, Nothing right. Like that. It's not like this. No, 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 no. It's not yeah, two completely it's not different hopping around. It's not hopping around. It's like it's just, left notes. And he said, as, as he said one, he said, "Well, you got to let them notes ring out." You know, that's that's what he said. That's he, he let those notes. Chris Monroe didn't do those notes. The thing, oh, is that he could do those notes. He was capable of doing. Yeah, he right. He Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it keeps that drive in there. And it's like, and he's really driving a point home is that you don't need this superfluous amount of notes to sound your best or to. Oh learn. yeah, no, that, that's exactly, that's exactly what, um, someone said. I remember, um, oh God, Oren Starr came over to my house when he first came to town and I was playing some stuff and he said, you know, he said, your playing sounds, you know, it sounds rough, but, you know, he said, I don't mean to say that, you know, he said, but it's kind of has its own beauty, like burlap, you know, like it's kind of like has its own, you know, kind of rough hewn kind of thing, you know, he said, but as I opposed to. I was trying to make was that a lot of people think Monroe played the way he played because his brain couldn't take him beyond that. That's not the case at all. He's he not was oh, no. playing uh, straight melody on something like that or Soldier's Joy, but he chose to play what he played because he thought that was beautiful. Again, yeah. going back to why does why did Frank Lloyd Wright design that? Why didn't he just, you know, yeah. do, he did what he did because it was beautiful. Yeah, not right. Frank Lloyd Wright couldn't go take his brain outside of that and do something compliant with the standard yeah. melody. Monroe was that way. He could play straight melody and uh you know he could do all those things chris was just doing you can go yeah he could go yeah, yeah to me that doesn't sound that doesn't sound as pleasing to me as uh right he, he didn't he could do that he just didn't want to yeah <laughs> Provides a great contrast between the mandolin part and the fiddle part. He lets the fiddle play like a fiddle, and then he plays it like a mandolin or like a bluegrass. Well, mandolin. it was sort of like that because. But Bill told me once. You know, I asked him. I said, "What, what instrument would you, would you like to play?" Um, and this is probably in 1966. It's probably. It sounded like a kid. Yeah, it's probably like 20 years. And I just said. You know what instrument if you didn't play the he said i know you play the guitar you know and i know that you know i know if if you what other instrument would you like to have played besides the mandolin and he said well i believe i would i would have liked to have been a fiddler you know he said that's the king instrument of bluegrass and then that's when i began to think of you know well that makes sense because what he's playing a lot of times sounds sounds like fiddle notes it's, but, you know, a lot of time truth of that, but I think also there's a there's a, a huge distinction that, uh, that a lot of what he plays does not sound like a fiddle at all at all. You know, and that would account for a lot of the downstrokes and a lot of. the. Uh, oh, yeah. The, but, the you know, those are the kind of some of the blues things that he kind of picked up and wanted to put in his music. So as much as he liked the resonance with the fiddle, he also liked the contrast. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, that that that's very true, because. People have said to me, you know, like I remember the break he played on um, play, on Scotland. He just played something very simple on that. And I remember one guy was was at a course and he said, oh, all he does is do that. And I said, but that's all the tune. <laughs> that's all the tune needs. And I said, that's not that easy to do. <laughs> you, know, you know, when he did that little thing, do, 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 he did something like that.
Merci. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it's just kind of creative that he just figured out to put that. And it wasn't like he was the true band leader. He didn't like, he wasn't like a guy. He wasn't like playing all of, you know, I'm Bill Monroe. I'm playing my fancy mandolin and everybody is just behind me, you know, like he kind of, he really knew how to, how to put in what you needed in the right place. And I mean, that's not to say that everything he did worked, you know, cause I heard him play some things every now and then that, that didn't work and, you know, but Good he point. was, he was playing, he was, he was messing around with it, you know, and I remember those Club 47 days, you know, when, I mean, you're sitting in a place that maybe, you know, can hold about, you know, maybe a hundred people. And a lot of times, you know, like if you came on Tuesday or Wednesday night, they weren't, you know, it wasn't full to capacity. And then like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it will, but, you know, every now and then he'd be trying things, you know, and, uh, and, you know, you, you just never knew, you know. Oops, sorry about that. I'm just uh, okay. I'm coming right here because uh, to, uh, in the chat, if 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 no one has seen this this uh, very interesting, well, you know, it's YouTube video, so it's listening. Uh, it's the seldom seen 1982 with special guest Bill Monroe. They're playing Rider, you know, which is this jam out tune. And yeah. Bill, and Bill didn't know it. He didn't know how it went. He didn't know how the melody went. He didn't know how the chords went. But he takes a righteous solo that a lot of people would be like, that is completely wrong. But um, but if you listen to it, his rhythm is so steady, it does not oh. matter what the chords are or what the notes are because his rhythm is just like a freight train. Yeah, let me, let me hear it. Yeah, I'd like to hear that. Yeah, yeah, let's just let's stop listening. Yeah. This, is, this, is, this is trippy. This is like, and then we'll get in some, some questions for, for Dr. Brown and then we'll uh, we'll do, do, do our, our, our usual, uh, um, you know, play around thing. So I'm gonna share my screen. Not that there's much to share here, but we're just look, I gotta I gotta find where where Bill's solo is. There's some funny banter at the beginning. Yes, sir, gonna... oh. All right, we have a we have an interesting thing here. This is a number that we did years ago. It's a folk song, and folk song means that we don't know who wrote it, so we can rip it off. Okay. <laughs> This was also recorded by the Grateful Dead. <laughs> However, we are the thankful living, so. <laughs> this will be good for you, Bill. I'm ready for it. Yes, sir. Actually, I'm going to give you some tapes you can take home with you, you know, All right, that's fine. and you can. Uh, <laughs> All right, that's fine. <laughs> learn some music. You know? <laughs> Okay, I just wanted y'all to hear that. I'm gonna fast forward to a solo. They're funny. Like, there's a great picture of like Duffy like putting his hand over Bill's mouth when he is. It, they had a really unique relationship. Let's get to the picking. The jam out to you, and I gotta find where Bill is. He, he just he just plays a, a huge shuffle. I gotta find it though. You can, you can already hear his rhythm in there, just like a freight train. There it is. Okay, so so Duffy takes a very like um, melody break, but Bill he has very no Duffy idea. break. <laughs> yeah, and Bill does not know the the tune, but but you could hear him just play the play the walls off it with with his rhythm, and we're about to hear it. Duffy doing his Duffy cool stuff. Duffy, Duffy knows how to jam on, on this jam grass stuff, but Bill plays bluegrass, and here comes bluegrass. Yeah. 
How about an F chord? Thank you, get that quick! Woo. How about a G chord? Are y'all going to G chord? Doesn't matter, because I am. Here I go. Freight train. Try to play a little bit of melody. Anybody up for an F chord? See, th there you have it right there. That is Bill not knowing a tune, but playing it so yeah. well because of his rhythm and his intent. He's like, I will play the chords that I'm going to play. If you play them, it does not matter. I'm still going to sound great because of my intent, my shamanic capacity to like channel energy in resonance with <laughs> And just keep that. It's so strong. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. A locomotive, right? A lo yeah. locomotive. Absolutely. And it didn't matter that he was missing the chords or the band was missing the chords. It didn't matter because that rhythm was so strong. Did you know the essence of rawhide in there? You know, that's the same kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's true. Because I hear a lot of people go out of, out of. Um, a lot of Bill's fast tunes, like like Rawhide and Bluegrass Breakdown, people kind of just tend to play a lot of orna ornamentation around the um, around the chords because those are kind of rhythm uh, rhythm tunes, and yeah, you know, like if you know, but you hear people just kind of sort of dirt ball their way through the whole tune, you know. That was very revealing what you just said, rhythm tunes. Now, I've never even yeah. heard that, that like uh, that descriptor before. That's very apt, though. Well, I, I just kind of, you know, like, you know. When... You know. just all kind of like back in, it's not like a tune where you pick through you just go through the chord progression and just play a lot of a yeah, lot of junk around it nothing doodly doodly about what you just did it was all like really heavy rhythm based you just stuff. i mean that's that's all it is and, and it's it's a it's a rhythm it's a it, it's and a lot of people just play it as if i remember frank frank wakefield who's another monroe head um um, I I did a couple of workshops with Frank, and I remember once he was saying, he said, "Well, you," he said, "No, no, no, no do my Frank Wayne said, yeah, like you know, you you don't play, you didn't play it right, you know, you you got to play, uh, you got to play that, uh, you got you got to play it like like Monroe played it, you know, this this ain't the right way, you know, you you don't have the rhythm and and timing of that, you know, <laughs> and then he would kind of go." You know he plays he plays it the right way you know you don't you don't play that the right way you know he would kind of, he would kind of go on, kind of go on like that Richard, uh, are you going to be able to stay around uh, while the students here demonstrate what they've been working on sure sure this is great this like is fun I'll, I'll probably learn something and i'll get warmed up 